the Humanities Department at Utah Valley State College. I'm Scott Abbott. We're glad that you've joined us. Today we have a special um, opportunity to hear about an exhibition at the Utah Museum of Contemporary Art. The, the exhibition is called Baggage, and it features the work of UVU artist, senior artist in residence, Pat Alex Caballero. It's a remarkable exhibition. Come see it. You can make reservations to come in at, uh, with 10 people at a time. They, they're very careful about the virus and protect the community. It's an extraordinary exhibit. Today we have a chance to listen to the people who made the exhibit and run the museum. Uh, we come to an exhibit from outside and we see what's there. We're going to go inside uh, today. Um, let me introduce you. There are longer uh, descriptions of these people and what they do on our website uh, for this event. But Laura Alredricado is the director of the museum and co-curator of this exhibition. Jared Stephenson is curator of the exhibition and an artist himself. And uh, Golda Dr. Wallace says she's a proud alumna of Utah Valley University. <laughs> uh, there is work for people with a humanities degree. Uh, part of the reason we have this symposium is to show what we do with our humanities major. Uh, take a look on the website. Now, the staff of Yumoka and Alex Soldier. Well, um, thank you so much for having us be a part of your symposium, um, Scott and, and, and the department. Um, we wanted to talk about first about kind of how the show came about, what our process has been, um, what how your work has informed our work, uh, and vice versa, and. Um, uh, but I wanted to first talk about how I met you. Um, so I, I was a young college student, and um, at the time, uh, my boyfriend at the time, we uh, we would do these performances where his band would play, and uh, I would show art slides. And um, I had seen Alex perform, and we thought, you know, do we have the audacity to just ask him to participate with us? And you know, we're just these like dumb punk kids, and um, and uh, and. I think we looked his name up in the phone book. Um, I mean, really, this very pre-tech uh, sort of technology. Uh, and um, I talked to Alice, and Alice and he, you know, was totally willing. And um, it was part of that, it was called the Life Thoughts uh, program that we did, and um, was so generous with us. So when Alice approached me uh, more than a year ago to, to talk about this vision of um, a retrospective show, um, I was already a, a fan, uh, so there was that, um, but I uh, was really honored and excited to collaborate again and to work uh, in partnership again. And um, this, this year is our 90th anniversary at the Utah Museum of Contemporary Art. And Alex, you've shown here four times. Yeah, four other times. Some were solo shows, some were group shows. Um, but we felt like um, that your work really captured the fabric of our organization because um, it's compelling, it's interesting, it's layered, it's this labyrinth of ideas, um, but, uh, and it's local, but you're also, I think, like, I think you're local, but you're not local, right? You have just this very complicated, or uh, interesting, rich history, um, both here and, and outside, and um, so we, we, I think, all felt really honored to, to work with you. Wow. You know, uh, I must tell you that I have no recollection. <laughs> I'm glad that you have a good memory. You know, I, you know, I, I have, uh, you know, for instance, I, I, I performed uh, at CBGB's with Blondie and all those guys, and I have no recollection. And That's incredible. Yeah. You know, television, the yeah. group television, mm -hmm. you know, I mean, you know, and I, my friend Bob remembers, you know, and I, I told him, I said, I said, I, I don't know. You know, I, to this day, I have no recollection. You know, uh, we, we even found a, a clipping, you know, just to be sure, you know, and, and I go, wow, oh, and I still don't get any recollection. So I'm glad you had a good memory. Well, I imagine, I think it's indicative of kind of your practice, because I imagine you were generous with quite a lot of people, and that you would 
um, you know, share your poems without, uh, I don't know, without any sort of hierarchy of like, well, you guys are quite cool. <laughs> 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 um, Good. So I appreciate that, and I, I you know, I think, uh, you know, I, I, I like that about your practice that I feel like um, there's something really beautiful and, um, and not quite the right word, but compulsive about it. I think you're, you're going to be making work whether you show it or not. You're going to be making poetry whether um, you know, you were doing a set of reporters books and that was a thing. Uh, <laughs> what, you know, whether you're reporters books or you are you're reporting MOCA and I think mm -hmm. there's something um, really internally driven about it. The there's way a, you there's an old Sicilian proverb. It, it says, do, do, be, you do evil, remember it and don't ever do it again. Do good, forget it, and keep doing it. <laughs> Serious. It's beautiful. Yeah. And, and I think as, you, as, as I hear you talking and I'm responding to you, I'm remembering the proverb. Yeah. That, and I think, I think that's, that's a good way to do things, personally. Yeah. You know, and whenever, see, to be rewarded when no reward is needed or expected, it just blows me away. You see, this is gratis. Uh -huh. You know what gratis means? It doesn't mean free. It means by grace. Yeah. Gratis. By grace, you know, not by merit, uh -huh. by pure grace. You know, not because of some payback not because of, of a reward. I think this is by grace, yeah. you know, of, of powers that we don't even know about. You know, that, that it's an acknowledgement of yeah. grace, you know, and, and so it's, it's kind of overwhelming. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> to tell you the truth. Well, I, I, that actually kind of makes me think about my role in this, actually. Because I, I've, I, I know your work as a poet, as a performer. I had seen videos. I had seen your books. Uh, I'm on your mailing list. So I, I would get these like, messages of what your performances were. But I really didn't know much about your sort of art making practice until you invited us down to your home. Uh, and it was, uh, you know. You bring us into the front room and you're showing us these objects and then you're like, wait, let's go downstairs. And so we get to enter into the basement. Um, and, and the basement really is, for me, as kind of the curator and the exhibition designer, the, the basis for a lot of the choices that I made within the exhibition. Um, but it also, it, it was the moment when I realized why this was the show that needed to happen right now. Um, and how I got to realize how tied to this institution you have been and to the art community here and how like, through teaching and performing, all those ways that you have just given, as Laura said, to the community and, and how it's, it's not a, it's like you said, it's not a payback. It's not a, it's not a, it's nothing like that. It's a, yes, this is right in this moment, in this place. Um, and yeah. Absolutely. Yeah. yeah. And, you know, I, um, I talked to, I walked somebody through yesterday and uh, they kind of walked to the show and then they came back to me and they said, this is a breath of fresh air. I did not expect to see a show like this today in this museum. Um, I've never seen somebody with such a free way of making and of mark making and an uninhibited way of um, being a creator. Um, and I think that there was, for, for them, it, it really struck them and it hit them in a way that uh, they just clearly didn't expect. So um, I feel like that's, that's gratis for us then. Like it's coming back for us now, knowing that we were able to do something for you. Um, and then that, in turn, is for the community. So. Yeah, and you know, when one of the kind of repeating comments we've received since we've been open since Friday, so we've had one public day, so <laughs> this is a very narrow pool. But quite a few people have said, I feel like I'm entering someone's private space. I feel like I'm entering someone's mind. I feel like I'm entering a cabinet of curiosity where 
it's this packed full um, exhibition of objects and ideas and um, poems and, and there's something really transformative about this place that feels very intimate in, in a lot of ways. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I agree with Laura. My position is visitor services coordinator, so I get to be at the front desk most of the time. And I was a student of Alex's a few semesters ago. I graduated this May, and I was so excited to hear that he'd be back and to hear visitors' feedback and thoughts about his work. Kind of felt like this little full circle moment for my fledgling career. But one of the comments that I loved the most was she was leaving and she said, that was amazing, I felt so transported. And I think that's the timeliness of it, that we want something intimate that feels creative and that connection to the intrinsic nature of all humans to create, but especially Alex's because it's just so natural, almost potent, like you just create because you have to. And I think, when you come, which everyone should make a reservation <laughs> on utamoka.org, you will feel transported when you enter this space. And that also speaks to Jared's talent, curated talent of curating, um, filling this space in such a compelling way. Yeah, one of the, Jared, do you want to talk about the woods as an element? Sure, I know, I know it's not something that you can see right now, but, um, I, I think from the first moment that we went downstairs to your basement, uh, I noticed just the, the way that things were sort of resting or placed on sawhorses and a piece of plywood or something along those lines where the space itself didn't need to be precious because the work was. Um, and the space just needed to be functional. And it just needed to, to be there for you to make. Uh, and so I took inspiration from that in, in the way that I thought about displaying the artwork and some of the objects that you've made. Uh, so instead of putting it on a white pedestal, which was something we would typically do here, uh, I went with a really inexpensive material. I just went with plywood again, but tried to um, kind of, in a way, elevate that plywood so it, it, it didn't detract or over, uh, try to outshine what you had made, that it really was just this, this vessel or this vehicle for your work to be shown. Uh, and, uh, and took inspiration also from other ways that you had made work. There's a, a piece in particular that has uh, two by fours with just a, a narrow dado cut down the center with pieces of plywood set in. That, set in. And I used that as a reference point for some shelving that I built for some of your small mono prints that you've painted. Uh, so the, the monoprints actually just rest inside and sort of lean back, um, almost like I think about the, the photo of um, the photos you have of your family, uh, the shrine, uh, and just the way that they, they're sort of there and presenting themselves and, and they're present uh, through that action of just sort of slightly leaning back. Um, so yeah, it inspired a lot of the ways that I constructed things and the way I thought about moving through the space. I didn't want it to be uh, crowded, right? Which maybe your, your basement may a little bit be. Um, <laughs> just a little bit. Uh, because I, I knew that people needed to move around, but I also wanted to, to sort of, um, uh, and I don't actually do this all the time, uh, sort of think about where the objects wanted to be in the space, maybe more so than thinking about exactly how to place them in the space. Uh, and uh, usually I, I'm much more methodical in terms of uh, building and arranging. So in the other room, we have the three televisions that are playing different eras and different performances. Uh, and then we have a couple of display cases that actually exist in that space. And they all, they, they're not aligned. They're not on a grid. Um, they allow you to kind of move past and through and inside and out. Uh, and it, 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 it took on the life of feeling like your basement without actually being your basement. Yeah. You know, one of the things you said when you were organizing this exhibition, which um, felt very heavy to me, because no artist has ever said this, um, was that this show for you was this grand examination of consciousness. And I thought, Oh. <laughs> <laughs> that was a burden on me. Yeah, hey. but this is a burden on everyone. <laughs> <laughs> um, and you know, in in the essay that I wrote, I, I said you know it, it's difficult because we are neither um, you know uh, psychoanalysts or clergy. You know, how are we to do this grand examination? But I think I 
think I'd, I'd love, love to have you talk about why this at stake for you and how you see that either manifesting in the exhibition either successfully or manifesting in, in how it how okay. it shows how it shows up for you I, I think the the key is uh, in in ideas about making the the word uh, maker makar the old Celtic uh, with the Greek poesis which again means making hmm. and you make yourself by what you make and in the traditional societies especially and I'm talking about islander societies uh, South American societies, traditional societies, going back millennia, you know, this idea of, of a connection with making and making who you are, and who you are is a process of making. You know, there's a kind of symbiotic relationship between objects that are made and the person that made them. That's why I call them para objects, is the fact that they're no longer isolated as physical entities, but they reference back to emotions, to people who were there using them. And we all have this. Your great grandmother's ring. It's become an artifact. More than an artifact. See, that's why I had to make para objects. Because it's, it's not, not just an artifact. artifact. It's, it's almost like a mixture between uh, an artifact, an object, and a and a <laughs> you know the piece of no no the piece of a of a saint the bones what do they call it a relic and a relic yeah yeah it's it's a it's a hybrid between a relic, an artifact, and a mere object. Yeah. Mm -hmm. It's like this, this impasto that I call para objects. Mm -hmm. It's an impasto of those things. So they're eminently charged with, with emotion, with a history. Mm -hmm. You know, I, I, I look at my grandmother's quilt that she had over, and I touch it, and I'm going back 400 years to the hands that made it to all the, the making that went into it. Mm -hmm. And this is, we have to understand that this is real. But they say, but that's a product of your imagination. Yes. The imagination is this creative organ that we're built with. Right. You know, it's where the genius in us is. So you're saying it's a product of the imagination? Definitely. Of course. Mm -hmm. But, but we've degraded when, when you say you just, just imagined it. it. It's like saying you just, just made it up and it's an illusion and it's not really there. When in reality, it is there. Everything that we're, this was an imaginary thing once. This building was an imaginary, you cannot name anything that was not imaginary. It didn't start in this image making, reality making thing that we're built from, of, with. You see, so that's why having this, you know, and I, you know, I first felt it when we opened up that first big box hmm. and you started taking stuff out. I go, oh my God. It was like a rush. Yeah. Because I hadn't seen some of them in 30 years. Yeah. You know, there was like a rush of energy of things that I had made that somehow it were here. Mm -hmm. And that's when the examination, consciousness is that sphere of the imagination, consciousness. You know? And so I began to I go, oh, I see where this is going to go. I see what's happening here. And then another box. Mm -hmm. You know, when you pull that out, I, I almost fainted. Uh, the, the sculpture, sculpture. Yeah, yeah, the coincidence. Yeah. When you pulled it out like that, I go, oh, wow. Yeah. It was like, like a revelation. Mm -hmm. 
you, you know, know because, because if you haven't noticed by now, I have such a terrible memory. Did I make that? <laughs> yeah, yeah. <laughs> Seriously, yeah. You know, so when I say that, that's what I mean about an examination of and mm -hmm. by reference an examination of conscience. Yeah. What you value, what you hold to be real, mm -hmm. you know, what you hold to be true. These are kind of corny words these days. Real, mm -hmm. honesty, integrity, sacrifice, you know, all those things mm -hmm. that, that, that traditionally are to be valued. And I'm talking about conservatives. Sure. You know, this is not talking about tradition, meaning those things that are handed down. Mm -hmm. Things that have been handed down that are still viable and alive. You know, those are the, the, the things that we, in a museum, you know, the museum, I'm glad they changed the name because a museum is, is a place where the muses, you know, it's a place where the muses, all of human making, you know, in the arts, and music, and theater, all the nine muses, you know, work together to preserve as a, as a common, a common treasure of humanity. That's what museums have always been. You know, I went to the museum in, in Naples. I was doing research on volcanoes a year and a half ago, two mm. years ago. And, and I've always wanted to go to the museum in Naples. And I'm finally there. And then it blew me away. I mean, that's a museum. The Metropolitan Museum is not to be scoffed at. Incredible. Yeah. You know, and these are the patrimony. This is like a miniature museum. It's a better word than gallery. It's a better word than art. Center. Center. <laughs> I despise <laughs> an art, art, center. Yeah. Art, center. <laughs> art, art, art. But I think that, I think that goes into the idea that some of the things that, are st that we talked about in the exhibition is that um, you don't call yourself an artist, right? Yeah, there's that, but. Um, yeah, yeah that, that, that you've found, found your own ways to describe what you do outside of that word art or art center. Um, and I found that really interesting because, you know, I went to art school. I studied to be an artist, uh, all of those things. Um, and I see similarities clearly between what you do and what we are taught in art school. But I, I really respected the idea that you were willing to exist outside of that system. Um, and kind of just make to make, and we keep, and I think in our conversations we kept going back to that word make, that that you would you you own that word. Yes, I am a maker, um, and uh, I think I was really drawn to that part of our conversations, and that also drew me to all the different work that's in the show. Is that it? it um, it's that openness that I talked about, um, and something that you mentioned. This sort of just need to make, um, and. Uh, it, and and we even said this the other day, I probably could have filled three of these rooms easily with what you have. Uh, so there was a difficulty in making these decisions within the museum to, of what to show and how to show it. Um, but I think your willingness to exist outside of that word art again allowed me to be a little bit more playful too with the decisions that I was making. Um, and to not have that pretense inform what I was selecting of, of art. Um, and it allowed for a much more open way of curating and a much more open way of thinking about how everything mixed and interrelates with each other. Yeah. So. Yeah, when you were talking a lot about that, um, Alex, just in terms of how your practice of like, submitting to make and, and, and even the style of what you do um, gave, gave us permission, permission to, to, to try new things and to experiment. And, um, you know, one of the things Jerry said was that there was just so much work to gather and so much work to try and manage and try to feel like, you know, how do we tell this story? Yeah. And, 
Um, so we did, we recently started a press um, and had done one book um, that was about 100 pages, um, but you know, relatively small. Um, that was supposed to be the scope of your book. <laughs> and it just kept growing and it kept calling itself to be bigger and to be more substantial. Oh, thanks, Scott. Um, and we <laughs> together. <laughs> <laughs> um, but one of the one most amazing things is the amount of people that, um, you know, really prominent writers and thinkers and scholars and filmmakers that are just fans of yours. Um, when we set the timeline, um, it was so condensed and almost impossibly condensed. And we reached out to authors and said, you know, hey, we need your essay. We need it polished and like publication ready. We have one month. Um, and, you know, no one got their eye, and we've been added people in the shorter timelines, um, and we're able to get seven really um, important and significant authors, and, and as well as have seven artist statements throughout the book, which I think is really powerful because it allows you to kind of approach your art like, well, you can look at it this way, or you can look at it this way, or you can look at it this way, and, um, and all of that I think is really rich and, and meaningful. Um, and. And Jared and I spent a lot of time talking about, like, even how I wrote my essay was so uh, different than how I typically write. Um, I was trying a very different lens, yeah. and even curatorially, we yep. were taking on, you, you released us from some burdens of tradition, and we just wrote, or we just curated, we just designed, and, and it was very freeing. Yeah, absolutely. I am typically a sparse curator. I don't usually put a lot of ex like work in an exhibition, um, but that didn't feel right. That wasn't the right way to go about this. So um, it, yeah, I kind of pulled back from myself on that and said, we gotta, we have to pack it as much as we can. Not too, not too much, but we have to pack it because uh, to truly get a sense of the scope of what you've done over the past 50 years, it's, it can't be four pieces that exist in a quiet room. It has to be in a room that's that's as loud and as sort of powerful as your performances so um yeah it was it was nice like and freeing definitely so yeah yeah well a big part of his work and if you've taken his class um it's a lot about language as he was just speaking kind of the value that we associate with different words and how they've lost a lot of their meaning and become trite and so with language and the sonosopher aspect, a sound philosopher, we do outreach virtually um, for now. And we just visit different classrooms, mostly elementary. And so we just finished one more related to material issues, which is another amazing exhibition all about like texture and traditions and those objects. But moving forward with this exhibition, it will be about poetry. and. It's such an amazing way to express yourself, and um, taking his class is kind of a trip. I mean, <laughs> even just hearing him talk now, I'm like... But no drugs. Yes. No, no, no drugs. drugs. No, no drugs. <laughs> yeah. So I highly recommend taking the class, but I'm kind of... And as I watched his documentary, I was remembering um, and I know you don't love that word, <laughs> um, but it was coming back to me all the feelings that I had from that class and how exiting the classroom, everything becomes your muse. Like, I'd see friends and be so inspired by their eyeliner, or I was a ballet major at the time and I'd go to dance and it just had this extra feeling about it. And, it was so sensory, but in a new way with the music. And so I could go on, but with these classroom visits, we really want to invite the students to think about language in new ways and that to give them permission to be the makers that they are because everyone is. It's whether you believe in deities or just universally like endowed creativity, everyone is a maker. and the language that we share all together is really precious. So I will report back to you how the <laughs> students do with their poems, but I'm really looking forward to it. You know, my, my kids were, have always been an inspiration to me. 
the, the way, way they, they make. make. Mm -hmm. I've, I've always, always enjoyed watching them work mm -hmm. with images and, and, and sculpting and, and forming things. Yeah. And, and I would just, just be fascinated by watching them. them. I said, look, look at them. He, he just, just puts down one color and picks up another one. How does he do that? Yeah. Look, look at her. Look at what she did. just did. She, she just, just finished, finished it. Without, she, she knew it was done. done. Goes, Goes on to the next one. one. How, How do they do, do this? I want to be there. there. That's, That's where, where I want to go. go. Mm -hmm. I, and and I, I was always, you know, when they were two years old, three years old. But now I look at my grandkids, same thing. I'm always fascinated. And watching them is just this. It, it just brings it all back yeah. all the time, you, you know? know? And I say, I can never want to stray mentally from that, that. you know, that. And, and it, it isn't, isn't about permission anymore, anymore even. Yeah. Mm -hmm. it, it isn't about, about what is somebody going to say about this, you, you know? know? It's, it's just the, the making, making. Yep. the making. You, you know, Picasso, Picasso said, they asked him, how do you know what, what you're going to paint next? It's by painting. <laughs> he was a kid at heart. Yeah. Yes. How, How do you know what you're going to say? By saying it. How do you know what you're going to build? By building it. Mm -hmm. You know, it, because you, that's the process of, I call it, surprising yourself. Mm -hmm. Which is, is a beautiful word in uh, ad improvisa, which is related to improvisation. True improvisation is a system of surprises, mm -hmm. a series of surprises. And these guys would improvise, you know? So I'm over here, and I have to paint something on those two walls for the, for the show Heaven and Hell. I had the two images on that, and I can't do it. And I go up with the, with the brush, and I can't do it. I go, this is such a beautiful white wall. I can't do it. And what's his face? Who was it? Rick. Was it Rick? Rick. 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 Yeah. He says, you better do it. We're going to only open it. Come on. Just do it. You know? And I go, all right. So I start. I can't. I can't. I would spoil the wall. I would make a mistake. You know? And that very night, my kids were painting and drawing. You know, and, and I took extra. And all I had to do was put the brush to the wall, and then it happened. You know, I mean, you know, and I knew better already. I mean, I'd been trying to, but, but it, was, it was new to me. It was a new environment. You know, that, and the inhibition all of a sudden struck, which I don't experience. That, that kind, kind of, right. I don't have writer's block. Yeah. What, I don't even know what that is. I don't even know what a writer's <laughs> neighborhood is. You know, I mean, you just put the pen to the paper, and then it happens. You know, you know, it's like... Well, what you were telling me, you gave me this one book that I think is very precious to me. It's called Five Homes. Yes. And that, and that one you said, you wrote it in 1980. I remember. And you said, those were the only five poems I wrote the entire year. And uh, I, I thought I was done. done. And, and, and there was part of me that, you know, just really identified with that struggle. There's so many times, I think, as writers or as artists, that you feel like it, it does require something in you to produce and to make and to um, put something out in the world. And I think it was really beautiful that you had this silence and painful and horrible and terrible and. Uh, and, and Five poems yeah. in a year? <laughs> That's ridiculous. <laughs> but, but, but for someone as prolific and as, uh, you know, who does not even know a right, you know, writer's black neighborhood, uh, uh, it, it was meaningful to me because I think, I think we all in our process have those stopping points where, you know, maybe something changes in your life. and, and Major changes. Yeah. Yeah. You know, I had converted yeah. to Mormonism. I had moved to Utah. I had all these gigantic disorientations, you know, and, and, and finding my way, you know, and, and there's one there about the United Order, 
you know that, that, that perfect place that, that is a thousand miles inside you. You know, that led me back, back. Yeah. you see, and because, because I was getting lost. Yeah, funny you should bring that up. Yeah. Yeah. Well, at the end of the day, this is five poems, so I'm not going to publish anything, or it's not enough work, or it's not interesting. And they talk themselves out of, uh, you know, painting on the wall. They're too intimidated by the, the white page, and I, I think there's, there's something beautiful about that stuff, and that willingness to say, like, yeah, it was five poems, but, yeah. and I'll publish a book on five yeah. poems. Yeah, yep, that's it. There's, there's, again, that audacity that I think is yeah. really cool. Mm -hmm. It's an offering. See, that's all I had. Yeah. And, and it was accepted as if it was a million pages. By grace again. By grace. So this is a work sort. It is a grace. It's grace, man. And that gives you the strength to work. Personal philosophy. Yeah, yeah. You know. And, and, and yes, by God, by angels, by the whole universe you know and 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 then it's like that and it was an offer that's what i had and that's what became a book yeah 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 thank you yeah and i think that's so important for college students especially to remember like we're all going through this pandemic and it's been such a strange year and graduating during the pandemic was really scary and Sometimes your offering is just really small, like it's five poems or yeah. you just, my friends tell their professors, like, this is what I could do. Like my cousin passed away from COVID. And so I think especially the juniors and seniors, as you're about to embark on your post graduation, I won't even call them plans anymore, <laughs> <laughs> like attempts. Yeah. Just to be like, remember that grace yeah. and to give it to yourself. and. Yeah. Things will happen if you make them happen and not to be afraid of that white wall. It's like mm. suddenly you're in this uncharted mm. territory and you get to create your own life and your professors are not going to give you a rubric for how to do it. <laughs> and you just need to start. That's the hardest part. It's just starting and once you create, you just trust yourself. Um, I was wondering if you could talk to us about distillation because one of the things that we see in your work is that you have one idea, and this is why this show is not linear uh, in terms of its organization, why the book is not linear. Doing anything linear would be very disingenuous to your process. Mm -hmm. um, but can you talk to me a little bit about, um, maybe you two can talk to, because I think you made some really interesting uh, distillation exhibition choices. <laughs> um, but um, can you talk to me about, A, what a distillation is, and you do define it in the beginning of the exhibition, and uh, how would you up? Yeah, yeah. You know, the notes that you that I read is the closest that I've ever come. It it becomes a matter of uh, of understanding the essence of something as opposed to the things that accrue around it. You know, it's like a perfume is a distillation of a rose. It no longer looks like a rose. You know, it, it, it's a hundred times more powerful fragrance than a rose. Right. But it originated in a rose, in something physical, in something of the world, something recognizable, that all of a sudden, through a process of empowering itself, you know, comes down to that drop and that other drop, and that other drop, you know, and, and you catch it, you know, and then all you need to do is this, and the whole thing is there. You know, it's like that. A distillation grows, and a distillation is not an installation, although it needs to be installed. You see, just like when you are gonna make some, you know, uh, uh, fragrance, or when you're going to make a uh, uh, booze, mm -hmm. you have to install the still, yeah. right? There's the physical things there, and then it goes to work.
and it grows and it's bread, B-R-E-D. You know, it kind of magnifies itself and it goes. So I'm in my basement and I have, I have pulled, I've installed my cabinet, you know, on the corner there, you know, and then before I know it, I, I put things in there, my, my notebooks, you know, like that. I didn't go through a process saying, gee, where can I put my notebooks? What would be a good place? All of a sudden, I just put them in there, you know? And then I go on this side and I go, well, I don't know this. This is a, this, that painting. My, my good buddy, Carrie Morris, who 1972, 1971, we would spend hours philosophizing through the night. Seriously, hours until dawn, mm -hmm. talking about in this case, we were talking about the idea of the birth of Venus. And we were bringing in this idea of, of geometry, mm -hmm. that the first making process was very platonic, uh, uh, criticalist, you know, that through geometry, that God made everything, that God is really the great geometer, mm -hmm. you know, and he, everything's measurement, everything is like that. And so we made that painting, made that painting, and then he, he gifted it to me. You know, and so I had always put it in the side. I go, no, let me put it there. And I put it there. You know? And then I put something else there. Like that. Unconsciously. You know, just by way of yeah, put it there. Wow. When did this happen? What is this? That's why when you first saw it, and, and you saw it, mm -hmm. I go, they saw it. And yeah. then when you want to, you say, we want to bring this down, I go, well, they're nuts. <laughs> <laughs> How are they going to do this? You know? And you did it. Yeah. My God, the day when I first came into this space, and I saw that, I go, oh, my God, I'm seeing it. This is, this is, this is absurd. Man. This is, this is not, this is not normal. This is, but it, it's, so that's a distillation. Now, it bears some resemblances to an installation. Sure. But that's like saying, you're a man, and you have hair. Yeah. That's it. Well, look at what I've left out. So the same thing calling that an installation, look at what you're leaving out. You're leaving out a process that took almost 20 years, you know, of building right. and, and of each time looking at it and being surprised, you know, and there was never any choosing. Yeah. There was never anything like, gee, this, I know exactly, I think this will be good for this. There was never any of that decision making process mm -hmm. as such. You know, it was always like, like kids when they're doing something and they put things in place, you know, or out of place, or when they, build something, you know, and it was this gradual kind of thing, you know, and then it says, and, and like, like kids, you walk away, and it's done. And you walk away, not because you say, ah, oh, I finished. You walk away because it's done. <laughs> not because it's finished. You never say, I finished this. Yeah. If you look at what kids paint or draw, they just stop. Yep. For no good reason at all. They go to something else. They just stop. Yeah. They're irrational. You know, <laughs> and so it's the same idea. Like, I'm sort of irrational. Yeah. You know, yeah. and I go like that. Yeah. But I was so impressed that you saw it. Yeah, it made sense to me. <laughs> I and I think it made sense to me because of where it was, in the basement. Uh, I keep going back to the basement, but the, I mean, I know you, you need to see the basement if you can ever see the basement. Um, it, you know, that, that piece is, to me, is something very different if it was in your front room. Uh, and being, so in a way that the basement, if we want to talk about it in these terms, is usually where you put something that you don't want to see anymore, right? You go in your basement, you stuff things down there, and, and then you're done with it. But your basement is not that. Your basement is where you go to see things. Um, and so when, when you look at this, this distillation on the wall, um, there, whatever time it took for it to come into that 
place of being, you might not see it, right? I, 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 you could have done that in five minutes. But there were clear kind of, not choices in terms of what you were putting there, but where you were putting things. It seemed like, yes, this is the spot for that, or this is the spot for that, and this is the spot for that. So um, I saw it in that way. Like, each one of these things, I might not know the importance of this object or why it's here, but I know it's important because it's placed on this like an altar. You know, the, the title of the piece is Altar, Altar. Um, and so, yeah, E-R, A-R. Um, and, and so you start, I start looking for, because I went to art school, I start trying to look for relationships in it. You know, why is this here? Why is this here? Why is this there? And, and they're not there for any other reason other than you decided to set it there. Uh, and, and, and it wasn't even a decision. Right, it was just <laughs> setting it down. Right. Yeah, it was an act of doing it. So yeah. um, it was nice to see it in that way because I think so many times we overthink things that we realize that sometimes just that, that simple act of doing it is enough. Uh, and so as I was putting together the exhibition, I, I have a model of this gallery built in SketchUp. And uh, which is a 3D modeling software, and I can take things that have been previously been made, and I can arrange them in the room and see how they're going to look. And a lot of times, I will, like I said, I will say, okay, this needs to go here because I want this, and I want this, and I want this. But with yours, I sat down and I just grabbed a few pedestals that were already made, and just kind of put them in the room, and sat there and looked at it for five minutes, and I thought, no, that's it. That's how they're supposed to be. And that's what I was getting at early on, is that like, I, um, I may have placed them there, but it wasn't a conscious decision as to why I was placing it there, which is very different than what I typically do. I was just simply clicking, dragging, dropping. And then I sent the model to you, and you saw it, and you were like, yeah, OK, I see there's some empty spaces. How do we fill them? You're like, what do we do to fill them? And, um, and then it became kind of a collaboration, and I really valued that part as well. Like, you know, oh, I was thinking of uh, Court Agenda being on this back wall, and I was like, ha, ah, so was I. Okay, where are we going with this? And then we started thinking about relationships between pieces on opposing walls. And on this wall, you can see, you know, or the book, um, and you can see certain symbols in this, the pages from the book, that are then recreated on the opposite side of the room. Uh, that are from a, a series of, of, or a body of work, or a series of things that were clearly done over a long amount of time, but they all relate back to each other. And so you start to see the relationships build up that, um, that, you, that I got to see in your basement. Like, if I'm kind of like bringing it back to where uh, I started. Um, and and those, those things, they weren't, I did, we didn't make a decision that this is exactly why they needed to be there. It just sort of was like, yeah, that feels right. Um, and um, that's what I saw in the distillation when I saw it. Well, yeah, and I think you know, one of the things that is really noteworthy to me in terms of your practice is this returning to an idea over mm -hmm. and over and over and over and over again. Because so many times, um, I, I mean, even in my own practice, I'll have explored an idea, and then I go back to it 10 years later, I'm like, why, why do I care about that idea? <laughs> or, or I'm not. I'm, I I ran that as far as it could go, and I'm not going back. But I think there is something very meaningful uh, to your return to an idea uh, until it becomes distilled over and over and over again. Um, and I I think that's something that shows up in the show. This yes. um, you know this one concept that that gets remanifested. Mm -hmm. Yeah, you see those three there. You know, originally, you know, it was not like that at all. You know, right. I, I was given one, you know, and I was given some, a couple to give out, and I did. And then in one of the moves, I lost all of them. You know, and I just had one uh, right. left. Okay. You know, and so, as a matter of fact, I was talking to my friend Bob Eman, you know, who published it. And, uh, and I said, listen, you do by any chance have some... You know, I, I'm, I don't have any more. I says, all right, I'll give you three. You know, so I go, all right. And so I, I rolled them up, put them aside. And then um, I wanted to, to frame the one. Mm -hmm. And so I looked around. 
And I go, how could I, you know, you want to move it, you know, to, to, to move it like that. And then I go, so there's still movement. And it's, I got three. That's a triptych. That's a triptych. Mm -hmm. And so I went to uh, Michael's. You know? Yeah. Hmm. I got affordable frames there. I go where, yeah. I, go, I go where the Relief Society ladies <laughs> Michael's Hobby Lobby. I stand in line with Relief Society ladies. They look at me like, is this guy in the right place? I feel like I'm in the right place. I know what I'm doing. Back off, man. I'm a scientist. <laughs> really, all these sweet, sweet people, you know, I, 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 I feel more comfortable than going to an art store yeah. or, or, you know, everybody, you know, you know I, I just don't feel comfortable there. Mm -hmm. You know, but the Relief Society ladies are, are just, they're just, I just feel really at home. Mm -hmm. Seriously, there's, there's, there's like, yeah, the we're makers. all trying to do something. Yeah, and they're yeah. makers. Too. And they're makers, yeah. Yeah, yeah. yeah. we're yeah. all trying to make something. Yeah. And we all have limited skills. Yeah. <laughs> you know, we have a, <laughs> you know. Yeah, budget, yeah. yes. <laughs> You know, and so I saw it, and I go, son of a gun. It's the same size as the thing, as close as I could get to a frame. It's the same. I saw, I, I go, I need three of these. Mm -hmm. And then that was it. Yeah. yeah. You know, now, with the other thing, with the in tongues, I had a different situation. Right. Well, you wanted to go to Michael's, and you said no. <laughs> no, I went there, and I said no. Because I would describe what I wanted in a frame, and they couldn't understand what I was talking about. Yeah. You know, I want a frame that's not a frame. Yeah. I want a frame that doesn't touch the thing because it's, I don't know how to, you know, you can't, you know. And no, no, everything they showed me, I go, no, no, this is not it. So I go, oh, no, I'm going to have to go to a framer. And these guys, that's too much money. I can't. So I'm just going to leave it at that. You know, and then I think we have some sort of conversation. Yeah. And this is, I think we know what kind of frame yep. this needs. Yeah. And you know, <laughs> damn, you really knew. I mean, to a T, seriously. Yeah. Because that's the way I had seen it. Yeah. You know, and it, and it was 100% perfect because it was starting to damage the pieces every time. And I had promised yeah. I wouldn't show them again. Yeah. You know, because every time I move, you know, and in one of the corners, it's a little damaged. Yeah, you can see it. Yeah, man. Yep. And I go, no, 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 I don't, I forget it. I'd rather not show them anymore. And I did them, I showed them three, four times. They're always as many as I had painted. And that's a long time to paint because it took me so long to see the colors. Yeah. You know, I have to see a color first before I can know what to do. It says, what color should this be? See, it's not like I'm going to put a color there. It's like, I, I, oh, I, there it is, red. So I keep these drawings all around me all the time. So now and then I'm just, it's green. And I know the shade of green too. Yeah. You know, and I just go find it and then put it in there. So it's taken me a long time to, to paint all of that because of that, yeah. that factor alone. Mm -hmm. So finally I had all 10 of them finished painting. And the last time I showed them was in, in that show uh, after the tree had fallen. Right. That was the last time I showed them. And I told you, I go, I cannot see this in a straight line ever yep. again. No. No, it cannot be in a straight line ever again because yep. it's missing, it's, a, it's misunderstanding what's going on in here. Mm -hmm. You. That's that freedom. And Laura, Laura actually made the final decision on that. So, and, yes. and, I, and it was almost the same thing. She moved one piece over and I was like, no, that's it. That's how it's exactly. supposed to be. Yeah. Exactly. When I first walked in, I go, holy cow. They solved the riddle. Yeah. Seriously, it was like that. It was like they solved the riddle because it was beyond me. Seriously, I, I could not, I could not figure it out. Yeah. And now it seems so obvious. Which riddles have that? Right. Yeah. Feeling, isn't yeah, yeah, yeah. It? Before yeah. you know the riddle, it's like it's a conundrum. Yeah. yeah. You know, it's this esoteric, and then all of a sudden, the answer is like two. Yeah. Well, one of the things I wanted to talk about, just in terms of the nature of this project was just how collaborative everyone mm -hmm. was. Um, and, and, and you, Alex, too, I think you were so generous with us to make decisions. Um, we did more studio visits than we normally do with an artist, I think, 
Uh, yeah. You had to return to the basement. Yes. <laughs> yeah. Yes. Yes. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Um, but you know, we brought up. I mean, we have work here in the museum basement now that would fill more and more galleries, and um, and the whole time was really, um, you know, it's a real credit to Jared for being such a collaborative curator and, um, you know, yeah. really willing to kind of be open to other people's ideas and to and to work together, and and such a credit to you, Alex. Um, for you know your openness to, I, I think we were we were making some decisions and and not checking back in and, and feeling like I think this is right I think this is working and and even within the book you know I think there were things I was saying about distillations that were not quite what you would say or power objects that were not quite what you would say and I think um, you were really generous and, and Jared was you know consistently generous <laughs> with his practice to just say all right let's give this space let's let's give this space for people to explore these ideas and. It, it's thank you because I, I yeah. we learned a lot. Yeah, and you're welcome, and thank you because I was just trying to learn something. Yeah. Believe it or not, <laughs> I was really trying to learn. Yeah, you know, and you know, you know, teaching is nothing without learning. Yeah, yeah absolutely. <laughs> Seriously, absolutely. It's not almost like a cliche. No, I never true. learned as much as when I taught. Yep. Well, I hate to tell people it, it's absolutely true. <laughs> so I was just trying to learn, mm -hmm. you know, and, and, and is, is it, so you're welcome and thank you. Yeah, yeah, yeah much appreciated, yeah. definitely. Yeah. Yeah. This institution is really special. We just have five full-time staff right now, so we're already a small team, but you don't feel that hierarchy. Like yeah. Jared and Laura are really accessible to all of the interns and the people that work here. Mm -hmm. We have two UVU interns, another <laughs> shout out. Um, but you work really hard to have that kind of leadership and collaborate, collaborate, collaborative nature of doing everything. And you just don't find that anywhere else. So that I don't think this exhibition could have happened anywhere but Umoka. Yeah. Well, thank you. Yeah. That, that means a lot. Yeah, uh, yeah, yes. really. Um, I don't know. Was there... How are we yeah, how are we doing on time here? We can stop whenever it's right. Okay. <laughs> All right. Well, I, it seems like we've come to a natural end, but um, I just wanted to just remind people about where the exhibition is. Um, you tell me where it's located in downtown Salt Lake. Um, and you can make reservations at utahmoca.org slash reservations or just utahmoca.org. Um, of special note to students, we are free. <laughs> so um, that, uh, you know, it makes it uh, very accessible. Accessibility is important to us as an organization. Um, and then we have limited uh, copies of the book. We, it, we did a small run of 300. Um, so each one is numbered. Um, and each one I think is really precious to us for like keeping notes of like who they go to and where. Um, but they are for sale in the bookstore. And um, and thanks, Alex. This we're, I'm really You're proud of well. this show. Good. Good. Yeah. yeah. Thank you. Good. Yeah. Definitely. Yeah. Same for me. Yeah. And good luck to all students. <laughs> yeah. 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 Thanks. Thanks. Standing ovation. Yeah. <laughs> all right.